I'd like to call my panel now. So since Peter is the rising star uh, agile, first question goes to him. So we reviewed a lot of uh, lessons learned from agile delivery. Um, which lessons do you see as relevant and applicable to CWDS project? So we've been, oh boy, we've been at this now for almost a year. Um, we started with an organizational cultural change. And so I think don't minimize the impact on your staff and on your partners and the support required in order to make that transition is, is immense. It's not something you can do and then walk away from. It's something that you have to continue to inculcate into your organization. And when you think you're done, you're probably just halfway there. So having, having OCM support, having coaching support, we have a full-time Agile coach. We're trying to bring in more. We've got an OCM team that has embedded in the organization and more opportunities to improve there. I, I think that's first. Um, <coughs> Agile, while it is an important delivery model, really focuses more on people than anything else. So focus on your people first. Then having face-to-face -face conversations, right? Being able to sit down and talk about what you're trying to accomplish. We talked about this in the procurement session a little bit earlier. Um, don't minimize the, uh, the impact of what you're doing and the expectation that people know what it is that you want out of this you're going to be bringing people along with you. Uh, certainly, what, as you're adopting Agile early on, the opportunities for uh, misunderstanding and disconnects are very high. And so having those conversations ongoing, in person, whenever possible, and making sure that people walk out of the room understanding what they're going to do together, and if not, get back together and do it again. And then I think one thing that we didn't do that we would have liked to have done would have been to have started building product right away. We spent about nine months gearing up for our first uh, delivery team to, to meet, work with us. And we've learned, I think, more in the last you know, 60 to 90 days working with our delivery teams building product than we did in the eight, nine months prepping for that. And so look for opportunities to bring in a small delivery team, whether you're building product or, or configuring product, whatever it happens to be, to work in that full life cycle. Um, it, there's nothing like shipping product than shipping product. And so you will learn a, a tremendous amount by doing what you're going to be doing when you have your vendor on board that you can't learn without that experience. Uh, and so whether that's engaging with the state's innovation office, it's letting a small sub $5,000 contract with a small business, it's looking at a pre-qualified vendor pool or something to bring in someone or in-house, right? If you've got uh, development teams or delivery teams in-house that, that can be pulled away, there's nothing like that to, uh, to help you understand where you're going to fall down so you can then focus on picking yourself back up. Okay, thank you, Peter. So the next uh, question is about the PAVE project. This is probably the most exciting project which is uh, going to go live soon. This combines Agile, it talks about the social interaction, social engineering, and uh, Karen Johnson is the executive sponsor for this PAVE project. So Karen, this question is for you. Could you describe how and why PAVE project decided to do Agile? How many of you have heard about the PAVE project? It stands for Provider Automation Enrollment Validation. And so I want to start with the business problem that we had to solve. The first problem is Medicaid. Our budget is about a little bit over 90 billion, probably 95 billion. State funds, probably close to 20 billion. We have 150,000 providers in our fee-for-service system. And we also have 13.5 million Californians that we serve. But our partners, who are our physicians, who are durable medical suppliers, all of those individuals today have to complete an application manually. And so we have a staff of 160 on our third floor at the East End Complex. We have paper files. It's probably one of the most difficult and complex applications that you can have with it being 1,000 pages long for the most complex. So 
We want our providers to enroll in our system. 70% of our applications come in are incomplete, inaccurate, and are required to go back to the provider to get the required information in order for us to process. So that's the reason why we had to go through an agile process because the Affordable Care Act required us to actually, number one, do monthly monitoring of all providers, 150,000, but also that we bring providers in to serve the number of individuals that we're serving today. We went from 7 million to 13.5 million. So we needed a process that we could stand up a portal and move rapidly and quickly because physicians that are coming out of school, they don't want to have to know about all of our regulations. They want to process an application. So we made it very intuitive and kind of rule-based, similar to, this is the vision, TurboTax. Most of you don't want to know the tax code, but what you want to do is you want to file your taxes on April 15th. So we, we knew that we needed to move swiftly because if we do not validate um, and also re-enroll our providers, that we could be at jeopardy in terms of our federal financial participation. So we needed to bring something up quickly. We're doing software as a service with a vendor who's very um, well equipped to handling the agile methodologies. And we also needed to train all of our staff. Our staff was not familiar with the system life cycle development. They were not familiar with agile methodologies. And so echoing what I've heard today from the panel members and the speakers, it's really gearing up your staff, having a culture and training them, and having the right people on the projects, but also having the right coaches that are participating and holding people account accountable to the commitment and to the process that we have lined out and defined. Thank you, Karen. So um, we've been publicly hearing about Agile for the last uh, one year uh, with all the noise from uh, agencies but uh, Paul Smith has been secretly pioneering Agile at CDCR for the last two years, maybe three. So my next question is to Paul. Please describe how CDCR has benefited from their move to Agile delivery model. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, I'll give you a little bit of background real quick and then and it'll, it'll explain some of the, the reasons why. Uh, we came off of a project, or the team I chose to, to transition as the, as the model group to transition, came off of a project that was waterfall, right? Uh, but in the, like everybody else here in the state, uh, who's had their scope changed for them, right? Who's had the target changed for them? Who's had the business come back and say, yeah, that's not what we said, we never said that. Or new management came in and said, I know they said that, but I don't really want that. So we ended up with a battle-hardened crew of folks, right? who were very good at solving problems and were very good at delivering. They took a train wreck and they actually made it a nationally award-winning project. So what we decided, but they were exhausted, right? They were exhausted. They'd just been fighting for seven years on how to be able to do this. So what we decided we were gonna do was we are gonna change the approach. So the very first thing you do, and I'm gonna tell you right, off the, right out of the gate, um, bring your business in close. Agile is not a technical term. Agile is not technology. Agile is mindset. Agile has a whole bunch of people who want to come and they're going to sell you a bunch of tools on how to be able to do it. But the fact of the matter is Agile is about how you deliver. It's how you think about solutioning. It's how you think about negotiating. It's how you think about the questions you need to ask. It's how you need to figure out the targets that used to be two miles down the road and you had one shot at it, and now it's 10 or 12 parallel, much closer targets that you can deliver. So, the benefits to CDCR. We brought business units in to come cohabitate with us. We have HR units, we have budget units, we have supply chain people who come and they live with us. They do their work, but they live with us. So that when we need to ask them a question, they're sitting right there. If we need to go through a story, they're right there. If we need to get through a problem, it's resolved right there. And what that does is it creates a synergy between technology and business. 
I no longer have to go to a steering committee and try to explain why I made whatever decision I made because I guarantee you their staff has already gone to them and explained it to them and then said, this is why we did it. And what, Agile, what else Agile does that's very quick that we've benefited from, people run it like they own it. When you create scrum teams of small, qualified, talented folks and you give them the authority to make decisions and drive stories to completion, you would not believe the results that you get. They're infinitely better than you as an executive could have done if you tried to drive it from the top. So those are some of the benefits. Other last benefit, we decided to physically change our structure. We tore out the cubicles. We didn't do it mandatorily, we did it voluntarily. I remember when I created the first workspace, I was alone in it for about, I don't know, four or five weeks. I just sat there in this open space by myself, oh. right? And then all of a sudden one person came, and then another person came, and all of a sudden we had 22 people that came. And then we took the, the vacancies that they left in the cubicles, we ripped off those cubicles, and then it started over, and it started over. We would bring in couches and potted plants and big giant screens that we would watch TED Talks on, and, and people would do their presentations on. And then what happened was people started to move to where the work was. In other words, you didn't go to your cubicle and then go to a meeting room to discuss something. You all cohabitated or you moved to where the work was being done. And then when it was done, you went back or you went to where your next assignment was. Final benefit, since CDCR staff and state staff took so much ownership of what was going on, our vendor footprint dramatically was reduced and our vendors actually saw the change that was coming and realigned to us. And so we're a much better effective partnership. They bring to the table things that we could never bring, but we bring to the table the institutional knowledge and the ownership that makes it successful. So that's the benefit. It's an amazing transformation. I like the phrase you use, you run it like you own it. That's why we have sprints. All right, uh, we have other questions for the panel, but would like to give a chance to the audience if you guys want to ask any questions to the panel. We did it in biz, but now it's doing, we've probably got, I think we've got about 10 efforts in flight, and they run parallel. That's the other thing about Agile, right? A lot of people think, you know, we've done an exceptionally good job of training our people, our control agencies, and our executives on how waterfall works. And so now when we do Agile, it scares the hell out of them, right? Um, but we run a whole bunch of things in parallel, so we've got about 10 efforts going. This is probably a quick question. Did CDCR use a pre-qualified vendor pool for your procurements or a, or no, no? We look for skill sets. Uh, and then we also, we went to the MSA, we used what Jim Butler was talking about, a couple of those tools. We have to retool how it's being done. If I'm gonna run a 30 day sprint, I can't have a six month procurement, right? Okay. I need a three day procurement. I need to be able to do an SOW that's two pages long, leverage what's in the contract, bring the vendor on, have them sit with me for 30 days, and leave. So you're, you're able to get the three-day procurement using MSA? Or? No, well, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, we've had to, we've had to try to, that's actually the, the thing that strips us up. Um, but frankly, we have an integrator that's with us right now that what they did was they decided to change their model from personnel to slots. And what they do is, as I need it, they'll bring in that skill set. And when we don't need it, they leave. Maybe another one comes in. So the integrator actually modified their approach in working with us in the contract. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, could you talk a little more about that? Um, just in brief, when you say slots and the integrator modified their approach, what, what specifically does that mean? Because so that's kind of exciting. we sat down with them and said, the model of... I get 22 bodies, and each one of those has a specific thing, and they have the lifespan of the contract, and so on and so forth. We went to buckets of hours and buckets of skill sets. And what we do is we meet with them on a regular basis and say, this is going to end. We're going to need you to bring in, you know, 45 days from now, a new skill set for security. 
or a new skill set for uh, basis or whatever it is. And when we start the scrum, that person's right there. And the other person offboards, you know, leaves. So um, frankly, th as Pete points out, when you got to have those face-to-face -face conversations, you can't just spring this stuff on people. This is a mindset. It's not a, this is not an approach, everybody. This is not Pinbuck that went from this big to this big, right? This is actually an approach. It's, it's, it's actually engaging everybody to be as flexible. People run their homes this way, right? When you have something crush your budget, you make decisions and you lose cable and you lose all these different things. You're agile at home. People are very, very used to it. You just have to engage them. I think we have another question in the back. Do we have another question? All right, so we'll go to our next uh, set of questions here. Goes to Karen. Given the state's long history and huge investment in waterfall methodologies, how do you approach change management in an organization and shift towards agile delivery? You hire a master scrum. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's here in the room. He can uh, raise his hand. Haren is over here. He holds us accountable you know, to the change in methodology. What you want to do is you want to educate the staff, but you want to ignite that passion and you want to get the energy going. Staff want to make changes. They want you know, to do business differently. They have brought these solutions to us previously. So now we're just um, having this opportunity to kind of react. You start um, with educating the entire group, but then you break down into smaller chunks, and then you have a small group that you can work with. You know, So it is business process reengineering. It's organizational change management. but. Just to echo what Jim was also saying is about the mindset. I consider it to be a disciplined approach. It's a philosophy. And so it's taking all of those things together, but empowering the staff to be able to make changes and to be able to hold themselves accountable and each other accountable. And then we have our master scrum that also holds everybody accountable. But it's also learning as we go. So we have launched. Um, two-week sprints and so we have done this for our user acceptance testing that's going to open up the portal for about 80 percent of our providers and then we'll bring in our next sprint our next release is going to bring in more providers and then the next release is going to be more providers as well so it's having it defined of what everyone's working on we did um, sprints that uh, achieved over 1500 user acceptance test, and then we also rotated individuals within those sprints to help so that everybody was being trained on what um, Agile was. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to add a little bit to that. <coughs> you, you talk about um, giving people the authority to make decisions and then having them be accountable for that. And that's a huge part of the change. Um, we, I found in our organization, Paul, I'm assuming you found the same thing, that there are two types of people generally when this change begins, those that have been waiting to make decisions and those that can't imagine ever making a decision, <laughs> right? And, and the ones that have been waiting to make decisions embrace this change and they run because you've now given them the authority in small increments to make decisions, come back and show you what they did, ask for feedback, correct direction, right? It's not a wholesale change because it's two weeks worth of work. The, the risk is tiny. And then you have those that are still sitting on the sidelines saying, I've seen what happens when my predecessor made a, made a decision and they got, you know, whatever bad happened to them. And you have to then coach them out of that mindset to say, it's a tiny risk. It's two weeks worth of work. If you make a bad decision, I'm going to support your bad decision. I'm going to help you make it better next time but I'm not going to come down on you. I'm not going, it's not going to be a big deal. It's going to be small because the risk has been minimized. I find it's, it's hysterical because I'll have people come into my office and I go, have we totally failed? And I'll look at them and go, uh, how? Right, right, we wasted exactly two weeks worth of time. We really didn't fail. Somebody could have been on vacation in a waterfall project and you would have lost the same two weeks worth of time. <laughs> so you really didn't fail. Okay, and the second thing is, I don't know about you guys, but I have staff that come in and they're way harder on themselves than I could ever be. Um, so when you have that kind of culture 
and you say, hey, it's okay. What would you do different? How would you fix it? Now, they'll tell you right away because you know they've been thinking about it for like two days before they bring it to you. And you say, how would you make it different? And they go, oh, I would do this and this and this. And I go, cool, that's your next sprint. Go. That's your next sprint. Go. Yep. It's and just that simple. It's that simple. It's a huge, uh, huge point. I mean, instead, we keep hearing about the failures and we have oversight agencies uh, looking under the microscope for these failures. I mean, with agile culture, it's okay to fail because you can self-correct in the next sprint. Uh, and that's a big cultural change. Uh, and we also have a self-governance mechanism in the agile we talked about, you know, sprint zero planning, retrospectives, right? You hold retrospectives, basically you're trying to see what's bad, what's ugly, and how to be done better. So with that said, my next question is for Peter. We have, we have these oversight agencies in the Department of Technology with agile allowing failure, agile self-governing, self-discipline. How do you see the role of state oversight bodies on agile projects? And what should be their scope, really? Well, we, we oversee a number of things on reportable IT projects. We look at budget, and then we look at expectations. And so our legislature wants to make sure that we're delivering something that's worth the money that they're contributing to the effort, as do our federal partners when there's a, a federal uh, matching funds. And that's a reasonable ask. We should want to make sure that when we spend money, we get good value out of it. However, what we know when we look at the history of reportable IT projects is that on average, we do seven or more SPRs for big multi-hundred million dollar projects. Way more. <laughs> so, so, some are, are, more. are double digits, right? <laughs> Way more. <laughs> Way more. <laughs> um, so, so what people believe is that an SPR was a failure. Mm -hmm. The reality is an SPR is a realignment of expectation, right? The failure is that when you started that project that people thought that whatever you said you were going to get for the amount of money you were going to spend and when you were going to deliver it was actually accurate. We're not that good. It's, we're, we're building things that are complicated, that are unique. We're not building track houses, right? So we can do the best that we can do. What we should be doing is figuring out, and I think we're seeing this with, with oversight uh, as they're having to help uh, come to the table and do work in a different manner, is it's about helping the project with the things that it needs to be successful. It's about having an investment in project delivery. It's about contributing the things that will help you make better decisions today, not asking for answers to questions that we haven't even foreseen three years from now, because we may not even get there. Please. I, I was just going to say, and, and the, the mindset's got to be different. It's almost like architectural revolving fund when or for facilities. They have this huge fund that they can draw from as they need it to be able to build whatever they are. If you've ever been for a large agency like CDCR, DMV, EDD, who has to, or Caltrans, who has to build things, they can't just continuously go in the budget cycles because, <clears throat> but IT doesn't do that. What we do is we simply, we have to create a, a business case and then an FSR and then now we go through stage gate and then we have to you know, do our BCP and do our funding and the whole nine yards. And literally, I always liken that to, you're like a, snar a, a sharpshooter, right? And you're shooting at a target a mile away right? And you spend all this time aiming and aiming and aiming, and there's all of these things that could interact with what that what you were about to do, right? And then we expect to actually hit the target. Now, one out of a thousand people can actually hit that target. They're, they're that good at shooting, right? But everybody else, you've just guaranteed they're going to fail. So what we need to do is we need to start looking at funding as needed for these small f sprints, quicker, more agile funding, quicker, more, quicker, more agile uh, discovery points of, of correction points, so on and so forth. I think that's where the control agencies can come in and help us out a little bit. Because again, this, this uh, somebody, our keynote speaker said, I think it's bizarre that we do an, an IT project that a governor is elected, re-elected, leaving office, and we still ain't done. Okay? Couldn't you hit that target? I doubt it. All right, we're almost out of our time. So thank you very much for attending the session, and let's give kudos to our Agile leaders here in the town.